Good afternoon, comrades. Thank you for joining us to tonight's session in our series, uh, The Battle for Democracy. It's actually officially our last session in the series. We're starting a new series in two weeks' time on the lives of the left. Um, but we're very pleased to welcome Penny Blythe tonight, um, who's, uh, I believe, from OneSpec. Um, and she is uh, interested in women's rights and an author and a campaigner and is currently in a coach whose current project is called Women of Wit, Wisdom and Wonder, Women Who Inspire. So thank you for joining us, Penny. Um, we were hoping you could uh, enlighten us a little bit about the suffragettes and perhaps even touch on the suffragists a little bit. And um, we can then open up for comments and contributions. I'm not quite sure how you want to structure it. We usually have sort of 20, 30 minutes introduction, but we can also do it a bit differently. This is run as a webinar, so the audience isn't quite as close up as it is in a normal Zoom meeting. Mm -hmm. So it's perhaps best if you do an introduction first and then we can ask for comments or contributions from, from the floor. So thank okay, you. So, um, so as I explained to Carol, it's, it's probably, I find it much more effective to treat this as, as much more in, as interactive. So, um, I'm very happy to, to do that and receive questions um, and respond. But what I'll do is I'll set it up first um, and just say a little bit about me and um, the sort of the relevance um, and where I'm sitting, the relevance for me in particular of the suffragettes. Um, and you mentioned the suffragettes and the, the suffragists because they're... Um, often, uh, as often happens, uh, media approaches and the media in the early 20th century was no different to now, um, like to set things against each other. Um, whereas there was a lot of connection and understanding and respect between the different groups and the suffragists, the suffragettes uh, really evolved um, as a consequence of um, where they felt the, suffrag the suffragists had got to. Um, so my background is very varied. I always say I've had a kaleidoscope career. Um, I have been a coach for many, many years, um, working with a whole variety of environments. Before that, I worked in education at all levels. Uh, and I still have a coaching practice, a small practice. Women of Wit, Wisdom and Wonder directly grew out of my various aspects of women's activism and feminism, and in particular, um, the suffragettes and even more particular, at the life of Emily Wilding Davison. I'm from Northumberland, was taught about people like Emily, and Emmeline Pankhurst and Josephine Butler and many strong early women when I was at school. So I was very lucky in that respect. So for something like 12 years, I have been interviewing women from all sorts of backgrounds about the women who inspire them. In what way? How they're inspiring the next generation and what gift or quality they would wish to whisper into the ear of a baby girl being born as we speak. And I say all of that because it's relevant in, for me in terms of suffragettes. So practical, you know, factual information, the suffragettes were founded in 1903 by Emmeline Pankhurst, Sylvia, and her other sisters, one sister that was, was less, much less prominent. Their concern was that for many, many years, women had been seeking to achieve the vote. The suffragists led by Millicent Fawcett had evolved very much to approach that through lobbying, through writing, through leading, reading, through discussion, and 
time and again were battered off, were uh, frustrated, were ignored, were lied to. And Emmeline Pankhurst, she and her sisters were, there is a thought that they, they were born in on the Isle of, I'm going to get this wrong, Isle of Anglesey. Um, and there was voting there for women and that this somehow impacted them, even though they, they grew up in, in Manchester. Um, their father regarded it as important to educate his daughters. So frustration abound really at the lack of progress. And ultimately, Emmeline and co set up the suffragettes to take direct action. There were a number of facets around that. One is that they really believed, and I think uh, from my perspective, I see strong parallels with today, um, that property and money were more important than the rights of women. And that if women did not have equal rights, then men did not have equal rights. No one had equal rights. Um, women had only shortly being regarded as parents rather than the pro just the property of their husband. They believed that the only way to change minds was to take direct action. Um, we see that paralleled today in all sorts of environments, extinction re rebellion, climate justice, um, approach in all sorts of environments. Another aspect of their commitment to women having the vote was that it, for them it was actually a quite, it was, a, it was a religious thing, it was a spiritual thing. Um, their heroine was uh, Joan of Arc, who they regarded as a powerful woman who had an impact. The roots of all of this go back largely in explicit terms to people like Mary Wollstonecraft and her writing of the vindication of the rights of women. Um, itself predated by the work of Thomas Paine, who was a, one of the first people to speak about women being entitled to vote. Before even that, the first women to speak in public were the women of Peterloo. Now they didn't talk about women and the vote, but they, because they were desperate to feed their families and to have a roof over their head. And that's what they fought for. And that's what they stood for. And again, for me, this threads right through to now when we, I can, a lot of us can get frustrated at the lack of involvement in creating change, in creating equality and justice in all respects, you know, in, in many respects, um, from the general population. But economically, an awful lot of people just haven't got the energy because they're just completely overwhelmed by putting food on the table. Um, so I think it's really important to be able to look at why what happened then or why the suffragettes and their ilk were so important to us now. Um, their campaigning was regarded as atrocious. They were, it's quite interesting to note that the first people to call them the suffragettes was actually the Daily Mail. And they did what an awful lot of women's organizations have done ever since, was they took something which was held as a, um, it was a criticism, it was a negative comment about them, and they turned it around and used it. Um, they were also the first people who were called terrorists. And what's, fascinating um, is that 
since then, we can track through history the number of um, times people who have been regarded as taking direct action and as being um, terrorists have ended up being incredibly uh, respected. So Emily Wilding Davison, the, the suffragette who has some, um, who, who, whose family were from Morpeth and who eventually moved back here with her mother, um, she was, uh, one of her famous statements was, disobedience to tyrants is obedience to God. Um, I kind of turn that round and say, you know, or, or I use that as it's obedience to good, what is good, what is right, what has justice. And I can see that, um, Carol, you've got children in the background. That's quite, that's quite good. It's quite okay. Because I mean, there's something I think about what's really important. Um, this is about their past. It's about our present, who we are, what we do, how we change things, what we can learn from them, um, how they can inspire us actually, and give us both confidence um, and the determination to continue because it can feel overwhelming at such times. Um, their past, our present, their future, your three girls that you're looking after, this is for their future. I'm 71 now, I'm moving on in life. I'm not stopping doing what I can and women of wit, wisdom and wonder, the crafted project I'm involved in is, um, it's very much about that and it's about a legacy. In terms of the Pankhursts as the original or the founders, I should say, of um, the suffragettes. At the beginning of the First World War, Sylvia Pankhurst very much closed, basically closed the, the suffragettes down. Um, she threw all the weight behind the war effort. Her sister Sylvia severely disagreed with her and worked tirelessly in the East End of London. And you can still see um, legacy of, of where Sylvia worked and, and how she worked. And she, I mean, they, they really diverged uh, as a family. Sylvia entered her life, she lived for many years actually in Ethiopia and is and was the first white woman to actually be um, buried in the cathedral of um, Addis Ababa. And her son Richard, the father of Helen Pankhurst, is also buried there. So Sylvia continued to fight, continued to work. Emmeline didn't. So kind of just like a very quick overview, but also where I see the suffragettes being relevant today. Thank you very much, Penny. Yes, yeah, sorry, I got a bit distracted with the three kids running around, but it is, it is life, isn't it, for women, especially if you're trying to do politics and have a job, etc. That's that's how it goes. But uh, thank you very much for this introduction. Um, anybody who would like to ask a question or make a comment, please could you click uh, raise hand, and then I can bring you in. I do have a few um, uh, questions for you already or comments then, uh, and perhaps we can see if, if anybody else would sort of like to ask. Um, uh, something. So I think you made a, a really good point about the idea that wh why, it, why it often is middle class people um, doing these campaigns and that a lot of poorer women were, you know, concerned with putting food on the table and men as well. I mean, this is the same, um, you know, there's a, there's a certain idea that a lot of people have that if things just have to get really bad and then you know there will be an uprising and the working class will will take charge and will 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 rise up and rebel etc which sometimes happens but very often doesn't happen for the for the reason you pointed out like the current cost of living crisis you know if you're really struggling to meet 
you know, to make ends meet and to provide food for your children, etc. It is tough than going to a meeting or trying to organize things and trying to, you know, be part of a union, etc. So that, that, that was an interesting issue. Also, the question that, of course, um, Frederick Engels was, for example, a multimillionaire, um, you know, that, that a lot of people have issues with, you know, when, when in fact he used his money for, for good uh, uh, as well, etc. So there's, a, there's an interesting um, dilemma there, you know, you don't have to be uh, dirt poor to, to fight for the liberation of, of the working class. Um, also, do you, want, do you want to say, yeah, go, go on. Yeah, can I, if I could, if I could sure. just say, I mean, I think I'm going to do a yes and there because um, there were a lot of working class women involved. Um, in the movement, and there were two things, um, at least, <laughs> the two that I think of, first of all, is um, it was the people who had been, had the chance to be educated, who could record and did record. And also on occasions, um, quite often, um, working class women, it was much more dangerous for them because they would lose home, they would lose jobs, they would lose children. Um, and so there was a sense in which they were involved. They were definitely involved. They were not always quite wrong. I mean, wrongly, we, we should have a, a record of them. They weren't always as um, well known by any means. Um, I mean, I'm just grabbing something because I, I was looking at something earlier on. Um, I mean, there was a, a weaver, a Blackburn weaver uh, Louise Entwistle, who was arrested in 1907, and you know, definitely a working class woman, but not a name that we that we know. So the, there was, you know, those were elements. Um, and again, we see such we can see such replications and things today, with you know, vulnerable jobs, for instance, and. There were unions, there were some unions that um, women created. And I, I will be maybe a bit controversial, whatever. Um, I think the um, a lot of unions have not always been supportive of women. Um, and I knew Brenda Dean very well um, in uh, the 80s. And she was the, the first woman um, general secretary of SORGAT and, and had some really difficult times. So. Well, that was, that was one of the struggles, wasn't it as well? Why the suffragists set up their campaigning is because they didn't feel supported by the men in the independent labor party and the socialists. Yeah, absolutely. And, and were arguing and arguing, take us seriously and the men didn't. Um, there was a question in the chat, which is an important question, actually. So there's been some criticism of the suffragists looking back now. They only campaigned for the same right that men had. A propertied men should, you know, had the vote at the time. And the suffragists um, also only campaigned for, for the right of women with property. Um, is that right? Can you can you? I, it, 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 it's, it's another yes and. I mean, um, you know, you you tend to um, you tend to act in your own context and what you know. So there definitely were those who that's what they knew. Um, however, there were a lot who wanted it to be for everyone. Um, and of course, when the first women got the vote, it was tied to the extension of of men's suffrage. But only women over 30, only women with property or married to men with property. And at this time, men who had who were graduates um, could vote in their the city in which they graduated and where they lived. So they had two votes. So it's it's a yes and and it doesn't excuse um, those opinions at all. Yeah. Okay. Not how we would see it. Tony uh, has a question wants to come in. Yes, thank you. Uh, a few quite random observations, really. Uh, firstly, an anecdote. Last year with Palestine Action, I was arrested and spent a week in custody 
And when I was admitted to the prison, uh, one of the first questions they asked me was, are you an extremist? So uh, oh. it was a woman, uh, a very nice black woman, actually. And I, I, I threw the question back to her. I said to her, well, what is an extremist? Uh, and she wasn't quite sure. So I said, well, in their day, of course, the suffragettes were also called extremists. Uh, would you say that they are now? So, of course, these things are entirely relative and people look, because, of course, now they have plaques in the House of Commons, statues in Parliament Square, etc. But say in their day, they were called terrorists. They were considered terrorists. There was a, a, a massive campaign of vilification. There was uh, the Cat and Mouse Act, uh, which was enacted again. I mean, it was very, very severe repression. Uh, let us forget, uh, not forget. But uh, that is how they were considered. But there were some other things uh, on the question of working class women. I'm, I'm no expert on in this area at all whatsoever. But from the various things I've read, there was a very strong movement for women's suffrage in working class communities in the north. Uh, and they were often uh, strongly supported by their men. I mean, I, I, I can remember because uh, they were attacked as well. And there was it, it was quite a violent affair as well, uh, in which men were involved on both sides, in fact, not not simply the one side. But I think it would be extremely wrong, because history is often written from the perspective of the most, the, the, the richest, the most uh, advantaged, if you like, uh, women. And the same applies in any struggle whatsoever. The way history is written, uh, it is backwards, and uh, it's written with a rose-tinted spectacles because the history of working-class women is not recorded in the same way as it would be in terms of uh, middle-class women operating in London, where all the press was, and so on and so forth. But I, I was interested in your hmm. observations. I also I, I, um, just to say the um, that the um, northern women that context you're talking about is very much that across the um uh, to me quite south northern women because it's across the the middle um uh, what yeah the it was the mills and the yes. um yes. right along that area mm. um you know and conditions were were desperate but Horrific. i mean and yeah. you know i mean women were still down pits up here mm -hmm. um so yes and history is presented as absolute whereas you know, the more we discover and the more we actually really listen, um, then the more subtleties there are. And I mean, that's actually one of the things behind my the women of wit, wisdom and wonder thing is, you know, I've that's got women in. I've met women in townships in South Africa, a sex um, a traded woman um, in, in India. You know, these are the stories. Women's voices are taken away. Both of my grandmothers were put into mental institutions. One was there for over 60 years and I was told she was dead and found out she was alive only the same year she died, about six months after she died. So this isn't, you know, it isn't dead history. This is our history. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, absolutely. I, I was going to go on to say, I mean, you mentioned about the opposition of what was it, Sylvia was opposed to the war and I think it was Christabel uh, and sorry, I can't remember the names now of those who were in favour of the war. Mm -hmm. uh, but I recall that the suffragettes, uh, I mean, those who supported the war, went around in the streets handing out white feathers to men who weren't fighting. So it was definitely a very middle class and in many ways, very conservative movement. I mean, there was that, I, I can't remember her name. I mean, she ended up, but there was, I mean, I was researching for a book I wrote on fascism. Uh, and the fight against it. And I came across the fact that quite a number of women in the Women's Political Social Union, including their general secretary, Nora, Nora Elam Dacre, I think it, it was her name, or the other way around, uh, who became the South Region organiser for the British Union of Fascists, for instance. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know whether you have or know anything about that, but I, I found that quite amazing that given the heavy uh, male culture, to say the least, of the fascists, uh, with their belief that women should be in the home and so on, that you had this attraction to some sections of what was the suffragettes. And the, uh, I'd be interested in your observations on that. Uh, I think I would just say I agree. I mean, it was, uh, you know, the, uh, like I've said a few times, it, 
they're not white you can't whitewash there's a whole spectrum and certainly that got revealed because of and during the first world war um so yeah mm. and it's you know it's shocking it's not something i want to know or believe but it's true yeah no no i know it, i mean it's more about the class character of the movement and it came together if you like, around a democratic demand, which is the right of women to vote and well, so on. Well, I, I, I think that, yes, and again, I think it's it's probably, um, you know, there was more it, more than, and and I, I resist regarding it as only a class because there were, there were many, I've just, my name's just gone at the moment, but the, um, the shoemaker from Leicester, for instance, was very much from a, a working class background. Um, so, and I think it's important for us, there are more and more people actually hunting out and finding the names of these nameless women from the, the working class. Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was a cross-class alliance in many ways. I mean, uh, but it, it's... It's split apart, of course, after the initial demands were won. But it, it's just something I observed anyway. But uh, thank you very much. OK, thanks, Tony. I think the the, the leaders were often um, the middle class women, isn't it, that we know about, that we we'll te- hear about in, in history books, etc. OK, um, Carol has a question or a comment. Yes, um, I, my, I remember my mother saying, and my mother's uh, passed away a long time ago now, but born in 1926. And I remember her saying at the time, oh, the, 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 the fact, the, the, the role that women played in the First World War, where they proved they could step up and do all the jobs that men had done previously, that that did more to get women the vote than the suffragettes. Now, I, 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 don't, I don't in any way attribute I mean go along with that view but I wondered how widespread that was Penny and was there any truth to it? Whether there's a truth is not something I, I think I, I, I can't say that however um, what I would say is that when those women who were enabled to vote because of course the suffragettes and the suffragists didn't think women should be given the vote. They saw it as a right that was theirs. Um, The reason that was given, and it is I believe in Hansard or it certainly is recorded for not giving women the vote on the same basis as all men was because of the war there were actually more women in the population than men. And the powers that be thought that they would lose power because women would take it out on them and vote against them. That's interesting. And it's, it's, I've, I mean, I've heard that on, on, you know, there are many people who say that the, it it was the war. Um, I think where it, I think the part that it perhaps Play, played was in terms of women themselves real, realizing, you know, even physically there was so much more. But I mean, you know, if you just take, I'm going to give an example of of Emily Davison's Emily Wilding Davison's um, family. Her father's first wife had nine children, and and she died, and it was always said that she died because she was frail. Now. <laughs> I could I could use certain language here, but I think any woman who carries nine children, mm. eight of whom grew to adulthood, and many women were doing that and working. Mm. So, you know, I think it made, perhaps made women um, capacities more evident, more, more um, public. And I'm sure it contributed, but I don't, but I, I think, you know, you've got over a hundred years of objection. I've just seen the note about Brenda Dean and yes, yes. Um, and I mean, you know, Margaret Thatcher was the first prime minister, but um, I, I don't have a particularly high regard of her and that's putting it very, very politely. 
<laughs> Thank you very much, Penny. Um, before I bring in a, a couple of other comrades, you did start talking about uh, Sylvia Pankhurst, who I think for socialists is a particularly interesting character within the the um, right for women, uh, the fight for women's rights. And perhaps we could expand on her a little bit um, because she did she did set up she did help set up the suffragettes movement and suffragists, mm -hmm. and then she basically split, didn't she, in in 1914 when her uh, mm -hmm. mother and and sisters they they all supported the the war drive and she said no, but she she went on to um, um, re-engage with the Labour Party I believe and then became a communist and believed it was quite important to have mass working class political action rather than the direct action that her mum and sisters were in, engaged in. Was that the, the key issue, you think? Was it direct action, sort of terroristic activities versus mass action, or was it more a general political outlook? You know, you oh, no, I think it was a political that. outlook. I mm -hmm. think that if there was a, a, a differential in, in political terms, um, and she very much worked with the women in, in the East End, and she you know, I mean, the Labour Party disowned her, I think, in the end, because she became a communist. But she very much saw that there, in, in her, from her respect, that, you know, that it needed to be more than. But, you know, if you look, again, even if we just look on that bit of history forward and, and look more widely, I think almost all major change, there's been at some point a really... Uh, powerful dissent, more than dissenting, you know, an action group. I mean, if you look at South Africa, for instance, for one, if you look at Gandhi, who did it differently, you know, very um, particular and targeted. And I mean, the, the suffragettes were very clear that it was votes for women because that to them, behind that was economic, social, political, philosophical equality and justice. Trickle down effect. Well, yes, they, and, and it was, you know, it was very much, um, it was a target. And I mean, they were the first, they were great. They were the first people really to use the media. They called themselves civil suffragettes. Sylvia had um, trained in art and she, she designed their uh, newsletter and their, um, badgers um, and was, you know, I mean, she was actually really good at marketing. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I mean, the one person in the labor movement, for instance, who, who, was, who was very supportive of them was Kia Hardy. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's fasc it fascinates me. I mean, I just don't know. There's so much more to know I know the bits that I know. Okay, thank you very much. Great. Um, Matthew wants to ask a question or make a comment. Yeah, I'd just say I'm new in in, uh, in this town in Glasgow, of course. Um, I think the, the very strong um, suffragette movement, and particularly uh, actually the impact of that through the First World War. That I mean, obviously the uh, and the fact it was it, it was very left wing. Uh, you know, largely organised the ILP, which was a mass organisation of thousands of members, uh, and was able to organise the um, women's peace crusade. I mean, the actual an actual on the street peace movement, uh, which could mobilise demonstrations of thousands, which was not a, an easy thing. You know, I mean, because it, it, it would be met with violence. Um, you know, led by by the state and by the church, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is why I mean why they that they, they would have march the marches they would have with largely women and children because it, if they if men had gone out then it would have been an all out you know uh, fight uh, and people would have got killed probably um, and you know so so that that was the, the the street position for the you know for the, in that movement and also of course the movement on housing which was again led by women. Um, you know the, the peace movement led by 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 um, Helen Crawford and, and the housing movement led by, by Mary Barber, and uh, of course I mean you, you know fighting the landlords. I mean you know, uh, so, you, know you fight the Hun in Germany, we fight the landlords in, in Glasgow, and you know pulling actually capable of pulling out uh, the shipyards on a on in, uh, engineering works against the landlords on occasion. You know, 
um, very, very powerful politically. Yeah. Thanks, Matthew. Actually, I mean, you didn't, I don't know why this, what you were saying there just, just prompted this thought in, in my popped thought in my head. Um, one of the things that uh, they all did actually was the, um, they used humor a lot. Um, and the, the um, there was an Irish suffragist, not a suffragette um, called Mary Malone, who used to follow Winston Churchill around because he was adamantly, he, I mean, he said the most appalling things about women and is now held up as a hero you know we're all supposed to think he's wonderful but he was I mean you know he was responsible for concentration camps in South Africa and he was absolutely against women having the vote um, and she used to follow him around as he campaigned for parliament and every time he opened his mouth to speak she rang a bell so he so he couldn't be heard um, and I, I think you know, the, 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 um, there was a lot of humour. They used a lot of humour and very pointed humour um, to get their point across. They, they, weren't, the thing is, they weren't afraid to burn things or blow things up either. So. <laughs> <laughs> nope. They, they also, the, the other thing that had a huge impact is this, the bicycle. Um, because they... Um, it gave, it was the first time ever that women could travel independently. Um, and they used it they, to get their um, leaflets out, to get their posters out. Um, they, I mean, they were phenomenal organizers. I mean, you know, if you take Emily Davison's, I mean, Emily Wilding Davison's funeral, organized on a sixpence and, you know, absolutely thousands um, turned out. They were formidable. They really were formidable. Um, and by the way, bloomers came from the name of the woman who first designed uh, skirts that were split so women could ride cycles. Thank you. Um, Marion, <coughs> please. Yeah, the, the first thing I want to say is that women have always been active in the track, there are a lot of working class women who were involved in fighting for women's rights within the trade union movement as well. And our history isn't written. And even to this day, I mean, it's been something I've been arguing for a long time. I just wish I was a better writer myself because a lot of our history is not even being recorded properly today. And I think it's something I've argued at Women's TUC over many years that the history should be recorded properly. Because if you're not in, if you're you if you're not in history, it appears you don't exist and that you don't play any role at all. So for me, that's a big issue. But that's for working boring. class women, I mm. think it's really key. I notice that in the comments, people have talked about Annie Besant and the match women. Well, I, I suggest people uh, read Louise Raw's book on the match women because she's um, she's gone out and, and done. History. She's spoken to the relatives of some of these women in the East End, and and you get a different picture. You know, if if you read the traditional history, you would only know that Annie Bazant, and it was Annie Bazant that did this, that, and the other. Well, in fact, there were very many working class women that actually led that struggle. Obviously, it was important that Annie Bazant did what she did in terms of publicising and that, but we have to start. Um, putting working class women and other women in the picture. You know, we don't necessarily need middle class women or men to tell us how to organise and what to do. Obviously, we, 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 I work with, you work with everybody. But I think sometimes, you know, there's this, this theory that working class women and working class men to that extent uh, are not able to organise for themselves and speak for themselves. And it's a bit, bit elitist, actually. So that's one thing I want to say. But the key thing for me is reclaiming our history. And I think people like um, Sheila Roboffin and other, other women that have written about working class and, and women's history are really important as well. Uh, and I think what the other thing we have to realise is working class women always have to work. 
it, it, it may not have been conventional factory work when they were married or that, but they took in laundry, they cleaned, they did other things. Working class women always had to work to get money to help um, support the family. Obviously, in um, I, I, I was in the CPSA uh, first Union and um, in post office telephones was where I first worked. And there, it, it took a long time. There was a marriage bar. As soon as you were married, like teachers, you had to give up your job and you got a marriage maturity to pay you off. But you weren't allowed to work in that mm. field once you were married. That was, that was the extent of the control that men had over women's lives, even quite, quite into, into the last century, quite a long way. Mm. Women couldn't uh, get high purchase in their own right if they were married. And let's not forget, that's not that far away. It's in some people's living memory. So we it's can't, not, it's not we've come uh, some way, but then we've yeah. still got a lot to do. It's, it's not long ago at all. I mean, in the mid, in the early 70s, um, women couldn't have, get higher purchase without a male guarantor. They couldn't um, have a mortgage uh, without a male guarantor. Uh, you know, it, you're absolutely right. Um, I see someone's mentioned the Herring Girls because again, they, they, they were another uh, group of women who uh, very much organized. And on the East Coast, there's the armor there, but right up the East Coast, they're very much organized um, and created uh, much better, well, not conditions, but better pay for them. Thanks very much, Marion. Um, Pat, please. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. And we can see you now. Okay, I, I think working class women have been underestimated in all of our working lives. I think from the suffragettes through to the present time that women have been minimized and politically disenfranchised from the majority of working class issues. I think the trade unions have got to, and the labor movement has got to wake up to some degree. And I think we have to organize in trade unions. Um, and I've put forward already that those who are not working or retired should join Unite Community, where we have an active presence in disputes in community matters and moving forward. I think we have a chance to reinvigorate our movement by being much more active than we are and we are lots of women who are active but we need to cohesively join up those women to be a cohesive and strategic force for moving forward i think it's been noticeable for me i would say in probably the last 10 years the range depth and amount of research, writing, um, and conversations about women, particularly working class women, beginning to emerge. I mean, there's the resources in the East End Women's uh, East End Women's Museum, for instance, which isn't accessible to everybody. If, you know, if you live up here, for instance, unless you're someone who can get to London, but there's websites and things. Um, but there's an awful lot still to be done. And I think from my perspective, unions do have a responsibility to research their own backgrounds. Um, I mean, we just have to say <laughs> the, um, the, the word history is his story. And it might be a hackneyed comment, but it's so often not her story. Mm -hmm. mm. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Thank you, Pat. Um, would anybody else like to come in? Please raise your hand. I got a couple more questions. Yeah, just on that, I mean, I, I just just a personal thing, but uh, the, it's quite interesting. Once you have a child, uh, that's when you really notice discrimination. I mean, I've had you know jobs where I got paid less than my. A male co-worker and you kind of you know you feel that's unfair but once you have a child and you're trying to carry on working etc and trying to organize childcare, it really uh, becomes 
a huge, huge problem, and that's not been solved by any, you know, um, in any recent um, legislation or whatever. It's still a huge problem. Um, I was going to ask you about something that I read when preparing for this, which was I thought was quite interesting. In 1913, the suffragists, which continued to exist, even when the suffragettes became quite popular, um, organized a march, apparently, of over 50,000 women to say that uh, we have nothing to do with those crazy uh, direct action women. We are law abiding and we want to you know, uh, ho uphold the law and we will carry on campaigning for women's rights in a non-terrorist way, which I thought was quite interesting that they got 50,000 women together. Do you know anything more about this? I don't. Where did you find that? Um, somewhere in the Wikipedia loop that I got into <laughs> preparing for this um, conversation. Well, I mean, Helen Pankhurst and I, and I, we've talked about this. I mean, Helen's an absolute mine of information <laughs> uh, and she's a very good researcher. I'm not, I don't count myself as a researcher. Um, and I, I mean, there, in, there certainly was a very strong view that, um, the suffragettes were extreme and that was held by the suffragists as well as as other people I mean even now we have people who say oh you know um so and so uh, let's just pick Angela Rayner is too extreme I mean I wouldn't say she's extreme but you know um <laughs> people there are people and women who say that um and I think there's a, a whole very challenging, isn't it, sometimes that women are, are not supportive of other women. True. Um, and want to feel safe. I think there's a, a, an element in, in that approach of the suffragists to feel that they would lose acknowledgement, recognition. Mm. But they had a very strong different view. I mean, and if you go to in, into other circumstances where there's been uh, dissent and there's been direct action, what some people would call violence, um, then you would find exactly the same sort of. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I think you said it earlier, you need to combine, <laughs> you need to combine uh, perhaps direct action with a sort of outlook towards the the mass, mass of the working class. I mean, if we're socialists and revolutionaries, we do want to convince the the majority, don't we? We're not uh, we're not interested in a coup that will come sign, uh, somehow lead to socialism. We're interested in the working class majority taking up the fight. And unless you know, as I think was it Marx or some somebody put it like that, unless we you know, unless men fight for women's rights, men will never be free unless yeah. you know. Uh, we all fight for you know that, that was racism. one of one of the uh, one of the suffragette you know stances that although it was about votes for women then and you know you can say and see very clearly that men in certain circumstances are as oppressed as women sure exactly um did did a lot of men participate in these direct action there were definitely men who were incredibly um supportive the and my brain's just lost the name of somebody I was going to give us an example there definitely were men that were supportive I mean um again from both middle class and working class backgrounds yeah uh, okay great thank you very much um I think there's one other thing I was going to mention which I thought was interesting um that apparently the way the suffragettes pronounced their name was suffragettes I we get it <laughs> we get the vote that's but that's again that might be a wikipedia rumor but i thought that was quite funny so rather than this uh, posh french i just i don't I, the answer is I, I don't know that but um the the uh, that does prompt me to think to say the the colors they chose very um deliberately um which were that um violet or purple was for dignity um white was for purity of intention um clarity and the green was for hope because hope springs eternal you have to keep hoping mm -hmm. some people think it was give women the vote but as i've said before 
um, they did not think women should be given the vote. Women should have the vote. Quite right. Um, needed perhaps a bit more red for the socialist <laughs> side of things, but I think that Sylvia Pankhurst uh, looked at that. We'll be we'll be looking actually at Sylvia Pankhurst probably a bit more in our next series, which is called Lives of the Left. If anybody in the audience has a particular interest in any working class history figure that is perhaps not so much known, etc., please get in touch with us, info at laborleft.org, and you could present a, a person that has inspired you or who you think who, who should be uh, heard about more and is not covered in, in history books, etc. So thank you very much, Penny. I know you have to go by, uh, to, to another meeting, I think, at, at seven-ish. So thank you for joining us tonight and thank you for enlightening us a bit about that struggle. And uh, it continues. <laughs> thank you, Penny. Thank you, everybody. Good night. You're very welcome. Bye.